Welcome to part three. Let's turn to inference now. So let me first say something about this term, inference. Some other versions of your text that you might pick up elsewhere don't translate the term for inference, which is anumana, but they leave it in Sanskrit, just as we'll see other terms left untranslated in other texts that we read and, and have already. The reason is because the word inference is used in a variety of ways in English and in other philosophical traditions, and these other translators want to make sure that readers ask themselves, what does anambatta mean by the word inference? However, we've run into this issue before. Plenty of terms that philosophers use, for instance, substance or form or pattern, need to be carefully defined in their particular context. So we want to ask ourselves what inference means for anambatta as we read, rather than impose definitions from elsewhere. So one important information to a uh, piece of information that'll help you understand inference in Nyaya is the Nyaya Sutra, which informs Anambutta's thinking. Gautama, the uh, supposed author of the Nyaya Sutra, defines good debate in this way. Good debate is one in which there is proof and refutation of thesis and antithesis based on proper evidence and reasoning, employing the five-part statement of inference and without contradicting any background or assumed knowledge. As we've heard already, philosophical, philosophical debate is a crucial part of the search for knowledge, and inference, in particular this five-step schema that we're about to investigate, is a crucial part of debate. However, Nyaya philosophers are not just focused on debate with other people, but they're focused on the truth um, that, that I might be looking for just on, on my own, perhaps. So he, he says also, when aiming at the search for truth, debates may be held even without an opposing side. So the idea here is that there's an internal debate, a debate within myself, and that's another way in which we find truth. And so those kinds of debates uh, presumably also include inference. Okay, so let's start with the two kinds of inference. This uh, slide has an outline for you of the um, text that we're reading. Um, you should be able to see pretty easily the parts of the, the text. He's very, very clear about each section. It's, as we've said, kind of a textbook for intro folks in, in any case. Okay, so we start with the two kinds of inference, and what Anambutta does is start with a classic example of inference, something that's widely used in Indian philosophy, and that's inferring from the perception of smoke on a faraway hill that there's fire on that same hill. So let's start with inference for oneself and see how it works. In inference for oneself, I've had a lot of experiences of seeing smoke and fire together. The traditional example is of a kitchen, but I bet you can think of others, and I challenge you to do that. It's a good way to make sure you're understanding the material. So these experiences allow me to conclude, uh, to generalize that where there is smoke, there is also fire. Now next, I'm out and about walking around and I see smoke coming out of a hill. I have a moment of wondering, is there fire on that hill? And this, this can be just a very brief, quick moment, but then I remember this rule or pervasion relationship that I formed. When there is smoke, there is fire. Once I've recalled this relationship, then I make a connection. Aha, this particular smoky hill is a situation where this connection between smoke and fire can be applied. It's like that. So then I conclude, aha, this hill does have fire. That's the process of inference for oneself. And we'll see here that the connection of the rule about smoke and fire and the particular hill with smoke on it is crucial for Anambutta. Because without this moment that he calls consideration of the prover, I can't put all the pieces together in order to generate this knowledge, this sort of moment of knowledge. Now, it's actually a matter of debate in Nyaya and under other Indian philosophical traditions, just what this thing called consideration of the prover is and whether it is indeed necessary for inferential knowledge. For Anambutta, it's a necessary step. We have to have a moment in which we reflect on the nature of this particular smoky hill in relationship to a general principle about how smoke and fire relate. Note what kind of mental events are involved in inference. There's an initial set of perceptual experiences that have to be in place in order to draw what's called a pervasion relationship, which we'll talk about. This is the perception of the, the smoky hill 
uh, itself. I'm sorry. Then there is the perception of the smoky hill itself. That is also a mental experience, mental uh, uh, event. There's a moment of doubt, of uh, wondering whether or not something's true, whether or not the hill has fire. Then there's a memory of a pervasion relationship. And finally, before we draw the conclusion, there's a moment where the thinker puts all these things together. So Anambata is focused on this mental process, which is required for a particular person to be in a position to know something about the world. And this kind of inquiry about how human beings, individual people, and times and places can have knowledge is similar to what we'll see other thinkers concerned with, like Descartes. It's a theme we've already seen in Ibn Tufayl. So one thing you might consider in your seminars and in your own time is the relationship between knowledge and doubt. Anambata suggests here that if I didn't have some kind of doubt about the existence of fire on the faraway hill, I wouldn't recall all these things to my memory and put all the pieces together to generate knowledge. What kind of doubt is he talking about in comparison to other sorts of doubt that we've seen and will see throughout this course? And do you think he's right that doubt is necessary for inference? Now, there's no mention of doubt in inference for another. Although it too requires the moment of putting everything together, the consideration of the prover. So another thing you could think about is the relationship between these two kinds of inference. For instance, is one more basic than the other? Inference for another is basically me convincing you or someone else that there is fire on the hill over there through what's described as a five-part statement. It's important to note that all of these pieces are part of a single statement, something that hangs together as a unity. They're not five sentences, it's a single statement. And this single statement prompts another person to have knowledge. In inference for another, we're introduced to some other special terms. So the thesis appears first. And why does that come first? Well, one answer might be something that you know from your own experience of paper writing. You want to set out what you're trying to prove first to prepare your interlocutor for what's to come. So the two parts of the thesis are the inferential site, the hill, and the thing to be proven. For Nyaya philosophers, there's always a place where the thing that we're proving is located. There's always a site. Next comes the reason why the thesis is a good one. And here, this is that the hill has smoke, um, and that's the thing that proves the existence of fire. Smoke is the prover. But why should we think that this, this smoke on the hill proves anything? Well, there is a general rule which I can illustrate for you. Remember, this is in conversation with another person. So I say, consider the kitchen. In a kitchen, you'll see that there is fire and there is smoke, and these always occur together. But not only is there this example, this illustration of the rule, but I can apply that rule to the situation. It's that they're relevantly similar. They're, they're not different kinds of cases. So I can apply that rule, where there's smoke, there's fire, to this particular situation. So then I, in light of everything I've just said, I conclude, I summarize what's come before me, saying that indeed the hill does have fire. So the conclusion, it is a restatement of the thesis, but it's a restatement in light of what has already come before, and you as the hearer should now be able to believe and know that the hill has fire. So notice that in inference for another, in contrast to inference for oneself, there is an explicit mention of an illustration. Think about this. Why might Anambata include this illustration in the inference? What is it that he wants his interlocutor to be doing? What, what does this illustration tell us about the prover? Okay, I just began using a very important term in the last few slides, and that's pervasion relationship. This is a relationship between two things, and this can be qualities or universals. So, for instance, where there is smoke, there is fire. While you can think of this relationship of one of association, it's really important to recognize that there's a direction to the relationship. Fire can pervade smoke without smoke pervading fire. Another way to put this is that all smoky things are fiery things, but not all fiery things are smoky things. For instance, a campfire has smoke, and therefore it's going to have fire. But a molten iron ball, so for instance, think about a blacksmith's um, uh, smithy um, place, 
uh, <clears throat> where they're where they're uh, making um, making swords and things like that. A molten iron ball has fire, but it has no smoke. So let's illustrate this with a diagram visually. This may help you. The circle represents everything that has fire. And this other circle, the smaller one, represents everything that has smoke. So fire pervades smoke, but not the other way around. So a campfire has both fire and smoke, but a molten iron ball is just fiery. Okay, so it's important to remember that this pervasion relationship has a direction. It's not just association of two things because there's an underlying causal relationship too. Okay, so now in light of all this, let's go back to our inference to the existence of God. Here's the five-part structure that we've learned applied to the question about whether God or Ishvara exists. So using the quiz function on Panopto, I would like to have you tell me what the site is, what the prover is, and what the property to be proven is. This is a good way for you to test your understanding of the materials. It's not going to be something that you'll gain or lose points for, but I, I suggest you to pause for a minute, try and see if you can do it, uh, and then check your work. I'm not going to tell you the answers now. But look at this inference in five parts. The thesis is that the world has been made by an intelligent agent. The reason is because the world is an effect, like a pot. And just as pots are effects of intelligent agents, so too the world is made by an intelligent agent. There might be a little bit of tweaking that you, uh, you might want to, to do here to make it exactly like what we've seen, and I'll let you think about that on your own. But I hope you can see how the thesis and the conclusion pair together, and then there's a reason and a rule application. So take a look at that. Think about it in relationship to the five-part inference that we just saw. Okay, let's now turn to the kinds of provers that Anambutta discusses, and this will wrap up part three for us. So he says there are three kinds of provers. Um, these are the things which uh, are based on their presence in, an, in a site demonstrate that the thing to be proven is there. So let's back up again and, and consider what are we trying to do in inference? Based on something we can perceive, we want to come to know something that we can't directly perceive. So what we want are regular principles that can help us in this. Causal connections between things are the kinds of regular principles which we might want to uncover. So if, for instance, fire causes smoke, then it stands to reason that from seeing smoke, I can infer that there's fire. So I want a relationship that predicts that every time there is smoke, there's also fire. And I can understand this relationship by focusing on the presence or the absence of smoke. So first, the kitchen hearth is an example where there is the presence of smoke. Going into a kitchen, I see smoke. Getting closer to the stove, I see a fire burning, and I conclude smoke and fire are connected causally. But what if fire only sometimes causes smoke? Or what if sometimes smoke is caused by something else? Well, if I want to check for that, I want to look for places where there is no fire, but there is also smoke. So take a lake, for instance. There's no fire here. And neither is there smoke, even if sometimes in the morning I see the morning mist and it looks like smoke, but it's really not. There's no smoke there and there's no fire. So I can surmise, fo fo them. <laughs> I can surmise fire and smoke are closely related. Where there is smoke, there is fire. And where there is no fire, there is no smoke. Now, if you're worried about this reasoning, hang on. We will talk about how Nyaya philosophers handle exceptions and what kind of observations allow us to conclude their irregularities. At this point, we're just going to consider the kinds of provers that there are. And we'll do that in part four.